thank you all for being here, and I appreciate the invitation to come talk to you all. It's just so you all know, this is not I'm not doing this out of the goodness of my heart. This is a recruiting mission for me. <laughs> for those of you who are considering different graduate programs, but realizing that the best use of your time and talent for a year out of college is to give back and to find a place where you can have a platform to make a big difference, I just want to put in the back of your mind, just considering all your different options to think about inside out. Uh, but let me say this. I'm, my name is Stephen Black, as she said. I'm originally, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She was here. My family's originally from Alabama, and and I say this, when I speak, I don't talk about my family. I, just, I hate talking about myself. I just like talking about the work we're doing. Um, but I will say this. The reason, as corny as it may sound, the reason I'm in Alabama is because this is where my family is rooted. And the funny thing about a place like Albuquerque, New Mexico, have any of you ever been to Albuquerque, New Mexico? The only people that are from New Mexico, they're Native Americans, which is a large Hispanic population. They're Mexican Americans. The Native Americans were kicked off their land and they're sort of gathered on these reservations with incredible rates of poverty and alcoholism and now casino money. Just the, everyone else is there. Is, is sort of that region of the country is the most sort of transient region. There are a huge number of people in the Southwest that aren't from there and don't feel rooted there. They're there for the climate, or they're there for a job. And I felt that before I could even verbalize it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being in a place that people come to because they like the climate, climate or a job, but I, I felt the lack of rootedness personally as I sort of grew up and I started reading about my grandfather and I started reading about Alabama. And it just, I was just drawn to it for the very reason. I remember hearing early on from my uncle and from my father that it broke my heart that my grandfather wasn't welcomed in the state after he started sort of signing on these very controversial decisions like Brown versus Board of Education. And to make matters worse, the school prayer decision, that was sort of the nail in the coffin of his family's, this, this state's regard for his family. And it became incredibly hard to be here if you were a Hugo Black child. And in fact, they all left. And my uncle, Hugo Jr., was getting ready to run for Congress at the time of the desegregation decision which is Hugo Black Jr. sort of a, that name sort of sucks if you're about to run for Congress and your father's in the, integrating the schools of your state. And so he got kicked out of the clubs he was in and it became very hard for him to practice law, so he moved to Miami. My aunt moved to Hackensack, New Jersey. Most, most of you know that. And my father fell in love with the Southwest for the very reason I just told you. It just seemed open and expansive and no one knew who his father was. And he immediately started wearing cowboy boots. And by the time I was born, he had a beard and a bolo tie, which I thought was completely normal until I was a teenager. So I was like, oh, there aren't many lawyers around the country wearing these bolo ties, especially ones from the East Coast. But, and I wanted to come back to Alabama since I was a kid reading about my grandfather here. And it wasn't like it was just all sort of an idealistic dream of what a great man, what a great story. But I was attracted to the story because it wasn't just an easy story. And I think for all of us, especially when you sort of tour a region like this, and you come into contact with people with white hair, gray hair, that age. I mean, I remember thinking this when I first moved to Alabama. For the first few months, I would think to myself, that person was an adult when this society was segregated. I wonder what they did about it. I wonder if they ignored it. I wonder if they were rude to black people when they were young. I wonder if they thought it should always be, you know? Then you'd see another one person be like, that person was alive too. I wonder what they did. Because we learn about sort of these polarizing figures. We learn about Bull Connor, you know? We learn about people who just, whose career was based on fighting for the system of segregation. And we learn about people who are thrown in jail a hundred times and beaten over the head because they were fighting. And that's sort of the way our history books are populated. But the vast majority of people fit into neither one of those categories. And it's a lot more complicated and nuanced which is the case with humanity. It's a messy story. Even for people who end up being popularized and known for their role in things, it's not always an easy story, and it's never as simple as the way secondary education, civic, and history books tell it, which I think do us a huge disservice. Think about sort of a high school book reading American history. Basically, this is a good white guy, turn the page. That's a bad white guy, turn the page. This is a good, proud black guy, turn the page. Well, that's a bad one, he just liked the it's never that simple. 
my grandfather, who a lot of people celebrate now, grew up in East Alabama in a rural county called Clay County. And his father was owned a general store. He was the eighth of eight children. And he was, he was really smart. He was a smart kid. And at that time, you could sort of bypass a normal, you know, like those of you interested in law, you go to college first and then law school. At that time, you just kind of can, you can just sort of weave yourself into law school. You can just choose a professional school. He first thought he was going to be a doctor, like one of his older brothers that had been interested in was sort of pursuing medicine. And he was so smart, and he was sort of hyperactive. He actually had a hyperthyroid. He slept very little. I sleep very little, but I need more sleep. I, think, I don't think he did. And he finished two years of medical education in a year. Just because he was anxious, it was too easy for him. He wanted to go by. He, he literally doubled up. But at the end of that year, he decided, ah, this isn't for me. The law is what more appealed to him. So he went to law school, finished at the top of his class. He was a rural country kid. Started practicing law for a little while in, in East Alabama, and then moved to Birmingham. And he became what we would all now call today a plaintiff's lawyer, a trial lawyer. And he wore these really cool looking, I mean, I wish I could get away with this, because I love cheesy stuff. My favorite car is the Corvette. I, I would be driving a Corvette right now if I wasn't a, just, I just don't want to be teased my whole, you know, and by <laughs> everyone I know, so I won't drive one. He wore these big, flashy, white, double-breasted suits. I mean, he was just a rock star trial lawyer. More verdicts reduced on appeal than any trial lawyer in that 10 year period in the teens and the 20s. He had more juries giving him more money than he asked for than any lawyer in the history of Alabama. There was a sort of combination of, which we have in the South, and it's good and it's bad, powerful oratory combined sometimes with demagoguery, sometimes with an expansive knowledge of the Bible that helps you sort of excite people even more. And it can be used for good. It can be used to motivate and lead people as is the case in the Civil Rights Movement, as is the case with the effort to remove children from working in mines in the 30s, or in the case of my grandfather once he was in the Senate, to fight for the Fair Labor Standards Act, to fight for, he was fighting for a 30-hour work week, which ended up being a compromise as a 40-hour work week. A lot of people are very quick to criticize unions, and it's, it's a complicated story, and there's thoughtful opinions on both sides, but one thing most Americans don't realize is they have unions to thank for the weekend. The weekend was not a foregone conclusion, that was, not a, that was not an agreed upon policy decision. The vast majority of companies were aggressively fighting the idea of a national weekend. And there was a faith side to that story. There was a very powerful oratorical side of, we need to, no matter how low class a family, and I mean that economically, no matter how poor and marginalized, there needs to be a sanctified, nationally respected two day period for a family to treasure themselves and their relationship with their God. That was a powerful fight that ended up, they ended up winning that fight. He sort of, sort of go back to my grandfather. Comes to Birmingham, he starts teaching a Sunday school class, First Baptist Church. Within about a year and a half, there are 500 people coming every Sunday just to go to his class. He starts joining every group he could, at first because it helps him with juries. You know, the more juries, the more possibility you have of a juror knowing you or feeling good about you, then the, the better lawyer it will be. It quickly evolved into a political ambition. And in addition to being an incredibly talented lawyer who was, who was in, in those terms, in those days, becoming very wealthy, practicing law, I mean, 1923, 66, $67,000. He was a millionaire, just a self-made millionaire immediately from his ability to convince juries to come up with verdicts against U.S. You know, steel companies and coal companies. And, and he set his sights as a 34-year-old on a 22-year-old daughter of a doctor who was not very happy to have him pursuing his daughter. And he successfully wooed her and married her, much to the chagrin of her parents, the Fosters. And then he decided he wanted to run for office. And you sort of think about knowing some ambitious 30-something-year-old turning 40, wanting to run for office. It's really usually not a good first step to run for U.S. Senate. <laughs> you, know, you, you think of even as talented as Barack Obama, he was in the state Senate first, he lost a race for Congress, and here's this really arrogant trial lawyer and Birmingham, with no family connections, no family money, decides to run for the U.S. Senate. And part of it was this grassroots, working class, populist campaign that he ran against entrenched, wealthy, well-known families. Part of that is joining every civic and social group he could. I mean, literally, the list is 40 long, and you all haven't heard of 35 of them. He also joined, in those years, the Ku Klux Klan. And I 
think at that time unapologetically so. I mean, it, there's not really a record of him sort of running around in the middle of the night in robes. I mean, I think it was a much more pragmatic decision, but he certainly knew it was wrong. I mean, he certainly knew, he, he, he certainly knew the weight of it. At that time, his biographers estimate that a Klan membership and a Klan endorsement for a race like that was an instant 40 to 50,000 votes. And a network, more important than the votes, of very influential leaders around the state, meaning county, sort of the equivalent of county commissioners and sheriffs and judges, this sort of grassroots kind of quiet network of support from the Klan establishment. Damn if my grandmother didn't win that race and become a U.S. Senator in 1926. And White Alabama was very excited. That brand of White Alabama. And he got up to the Senate, and one of the unique qualities he had was he was incredibly intellectually curious. He was a voracious reader. And he ended up, in a short period of time, in one and a half terms, checking out more books, reading more books from the Library of Congress than anyone who's ever been in Congress before or after. And part of that is he was sort of on a mission to educate himself. And something interesting happened during that self-imposed educational mission he put himself on. He literally, at the risk of sounding corny to you all, he became fascinated with sort of experiments in democracy, Greece and, and Rome, and sort of the founding ideals of, of protecting liberty and growing a society that can sustain itself and empower people. And that sort of led him to our founding fathers and this sort of this bet that a group of people made at the risk of their lives, which I think also gets short shrift in, in middle school. You know, you hear about our founding fathers, but to literally think of people choosing to risk their lives where it's a huge risk. It's not just a small risk. I mean, the idea of, well, let's do this. If it doesn't work, we'll all be killed. It's a great empire that we're going to decide we're going to be against, but it's worth it. I mean, this, this was a, an extraordinary group of human beings. And he fell in love with their writings and the ideas behind it. And he came to believe that the US Constitution was one of, if not the finest, most important man-made written documents ever. And part of that involved him into believing that racism and racial discrimination in terms of legality had no place in that. That was beneath the potential and the meaning of this country's trajectory. And for a lot of people, this is still just an, an aggressive, ambitious Alabama politician. And he easily won re-election. And Roosevelt, as a lot of you have read in your history classes, was being very aggressive and creative in trying to get us out of the Great Depression. And a lot of his initiatives were running into constitutional problems. And a lot of them were getting shot down by the Supreme Court, which is very frustrating to them, because most of them were really old men. They've been on there a long time. And as a lot of you remember from some classes, he came up with an idea to pack. He wanted to grow the court because he didn't want to wait for any of them to die. <laughs> that didn't work out. But for him, they all, fortunately, they all started dying anyway. <laughs> it didn't matter. He ended up being able to pack the court the old-fashioned way. And when the first Supreme Court justice died, and he thought to himself with his advisors, what's the best way to get the most absolutely strongest advocate for our positions on that court, meaning through a Senate confirmation process. And they thought to themselves, well, let's pick a senator. That way we can get someone who's really rabidly for us, and he'll have a better likely. If he's liked in the Senate, it'll be hard for them to, to turn him down. And Hugo Black was, I mean, he was the most extraordinary New Deal, New Deal senator. I mean, he just had these legendary hearings where he knew more. He, he would just die, sort of digest thousands of pages of research and come after these antitrust cases and just this thick southern accent, but by far the most knowledgeable man in the room with hundreds of people, hour after hour after hour, just 100 hour weeks in these hearings. So they picked him. And it quickly came, came out, because it wasn't a secret down here, that he was in the Klan. He had sent a nice short letter in the middle 20s after he was in the Senate saying, I'm no longer, you know, like a, I'm done with the organization letter. But to sort of think about how disempowered black America was in 1937, someone gets appointed, they're going through the confirmation process, it comes out that they were in the Klan a decade earlier, and what do you think happened? What do you think that meant to the process? Nothing. 
mean, it upsets some people. You know, he got through. In a way, and you can think, oh, that's terrible. Fortunately for us all, this is sort of an extraordinary story in the making. There's more to it than just who you think of as the normal clan member senator. And the human being continued to evolve. And then you roll into 1954 and you sort of see what you have. And you have a white Alabama senator, former clan member, who's on the Supreme Court with a lifetime appointment, who can decide any way he wants to with no consequences at all. And he decides unequivocally, unabashedly, without hesitation, that segregation not only is wrong but unconstitutional. And he proudly signs on to that decision. And about 50,000 letters come into our family within three weeks. And it changes sort of the trajectory of our family's role here, our, my family's life here. And that's fascinating for a kid to read about when they're young. And that was a big part of why I wanted to be here. I wanted to be where I was rooted. Even though there are a lot of challenges here, I don't mind challenges. And in fact, I think challenges are appealing. I don't, who wants to just go be in some perfect, settled little neighborhood and not have anything to do? <laughs> I certainly some don't. Do. Maybe some of you do. So, let me tell you this. That was a long introduction. Mm -hmm. But I do think being thoughtful about history and connections and rootedness, I think is important. I think the biggest challenge facing, you all are here sort of studying civil, one aspect of this is sort of studying aspects of civil rights and these legendary, literally world-renowned episodes of courage in the face of injustice at huge personal risk. That's sort of the story of this park, and the church across the street, and this institute, and plenty of other stories across our state and across this region for all of us, meaning the world, not just as a lesson to the south of the country. But I think it's also worth thinking about, well, what does that mean for our lives moving forward? In other words, is it just nice to know because it's an interesting story? Or is there a way that applies to the way I think about my code of ethics? Is there a way that applies to me because I don't have that test in front of me? In other words, I can't ask you all what are you going to do on Saturday's march when African Americans are marching because they want the right to eat in public? Because that's been settled. You all don't have that option to decide what side you want to be on. But I do think it's a terrible mistake to make to think to yourselves, there aren't battles and issues of that stature in my life. I think I would have done the right thing, but we'll never know. That's not my life. That, I think, is a mis is sort of a misunderstanding of not just history, but of current policy. I mean, I'll, I'll throw a few out there for you. you. Sort of think about the gravity of the moment we're living in. You happen to be sitting in the wealthiest, most technologically advanced, successful, productive nation the Earth has ever created. And in the last three years, the infant mortality rate has risen from 26 to 28 in comparison to other industrialized nations. Meaning 27 other industrialized nations have a lower infant mortality rate. Meaning fewer babies before their first birthday are dying. It's just a raw poverty indicator. And it's at what I would what I would argue to you are unethical levels for a nation such as this. Without even getting into over 40 million Americans without health insurance, still not being able to figure that out. Now let me make sure I'm being clear about this. Are there any Republicans in the room? This is not saying the only way to be ethical and thoughtful moving forward about health care is a single payer system like Canada. And it's also not saying the only way is to think from the right some entrepreneurial breakdown the regulatory barriers. I'm two steps behind that distinction asking you this. Is the status quo good enough for us? Is the way things are right now okay with you personally? And civically, as a citizen, as a member of this community, nationally, locally, is it okay to have a higher infant mortality rate with all the abilities we have than 27 other nations? You're in a state right now with conservatively a 20% adult illiteracy rate. There are a lot of literacy experts that argue it's closer to 25 in the South. And we think to yourself, wow, the South is really uneducated. 
It's not much below 15% in any state any of you are from either. I mean, it's, it's unbelievably high everywhere. And sometimes a college student, when they hear me say that in here, will raise their hand, and I appreciate them raising their hand because I think a lot of people think this, and they'll say, I mean, I'm not questioning your facts, but 20% that's one out of five adults. Where are they? Which I think is a legitimate question. And my answer back would be, they're not hidden in the most rural counties, counties packed into trailers that you never see down dirt roads. You see them every day, I assure you, if you're out in public. Society is flush with them. And sometimes college students think in their minds, that's true, functionally illiterate. And I can see their eyes, there must be a lot of lazy people around. And factually speaking, I can tell you, for the vast majority of adults in America who are functionally illiterate, laziness isn't anywhere in the equation. Most of them have been working every hour they can find since they were 15. There are a lot of complicating factors that go into literally growing from a child into an adult as an American without being able to read, but laziness is not usually the issue. And in fact, as you all could probably surmise, it has huge consequences for your ability to retire comfortably, for your ability to stay healthy. There's a huge embarrassment, humiliation factor that keeps it a secret for millions of Americans, which also costs them in terms of services available to them. But I think also most telling, it obviously has a huge consequence on the children in the household. I mean, what percentage of second graders being raised by functionally illiterate adults do you think are at grade level? Less than 5%. What percentage of those kids do you think are caught up to grade level by the time they're seniors in high school? Less than 7%. Almost a destiny locked into stone based on your parents' literacy rate as a second grader. Now I say almost because that's a big almost. Just because statistically it is in fact locked in stone generation after generation doesn't mean it can't be changed. Now the biggest challenge to adult illiteracy, to the delivery of adequate health care services, to public education that for millions of American children, by anyone's indication, wherever you are ideologically, is a raw betrayal of those children. The biggest challenge facing us as citizens in thinking through how to improve these, the ways in which society interacts with people, especially low-income people, is not the threat of another recession. It's not another banking crisis. It's not Al-Qaeda. I would argue to you it's the continuation of a 40-year trend towards civic disconnect, civic withdrawal. College educated and below college educated, one indicator, working longer hours than they can find when they can find work. Women pouring into the workforce in the late 60s and 70s to the point we're at now where the vast majority of able-bodied adults, regardless of gender, are working every hour they can find. That's dramatically changed our ability as Americans to engage in projects and initiatives beyond our own family's immediate needs. You follow me? This is the poison of an ethical society. It's a huge challenge for you all to keep in mind for the rest of your lives. Whether you grew up in a suburb, in an urban area, or a rural area, one thing I can tell you statistically is, as generations of 18-year-olds roll onto the campuses of America, they're coming from places where they've been less exposed to personal relationships with people unlike themselves than ever before. And so far, the promise of the internet as the great connector has not realized the promise. Most Americans find themselves on the internet. They don't use it as an opportunity to explore different worldviews and viewpoints and connect to cultures unlike their own. They spend the vast majority of their time on the internet with people exactly like them, reinforcing the ideas they already have. Which I understand is very affirming, it's nice to see someone write something really well, sharing your viewpoint, but that's not the same as connecting with other people unlike yourselves. And I would say whether you're Republican or Democrat, whatever you think politically, the core quality for being an ethical citizen, meaning if it means something to you to learn about the great moments of justice in our country's past, what that implies for what you owe people while you're alive, I would suggest it's an acknowledgement that at the heart of being a thoughtful public citizen, the core of the ability to act well as it relates to other human beings is compassion. And I don't mean a soundbite. 
I mean, the human ability that you develop or you don't to feel what it would feel like to lead someone else's life. To be able to see through someone else's eyes, seeing different things. To be able to, and you know if you feel it or, or you don't, to feel what it would feel like to be one of the millions of Americans working hard, proud to have a home in the suburbs, caring about your children, knowing you have them in the best school you can find, and to know 15 minutes away there are parents working every hour they can find whose number one interest and passion in life is their child and their child's ability to reach their God-given potential. And to know that parent knows that their child is three grade levels below your child. And to feel what that would feel like. And without connectedness to those stories and to the lives of other people, it gets increasingly difficult for us, meaning the most educated Americans, which is what this room is to participate thoughtfully in improving lives of other people. Compassion cannot just be an intellectual exercise. It won't grow in you. It's important that you know statistics about poverty, but if that's all you know about poverty, you're not gonna be very good. Now, the second part is this. This is the risk of the specialness of your generation. And when I say specialness of your generation, some of you may know, Statistically speaking, you all have become the most voluntaristic, charitably minded group of young people we've ever produced. What I refer to as the Teach for America generation. You all heard now, obviously, since you're here, alternative spring break. I may look old to you, but I'm not that old. I'm not that much older than you all. When I was in college, there was no such thing as an alternative spring break. I didn't, if someone would have said, do you all want to come down to the South to help da da da, or do you want to help the family build a home, oh, I'd be like, what are you, part of a cult? It's spring break. I'm going to the friggin' beach. What a terrible idea. Who wants to come up with an alternative for spring break? Who ever thought, how about an alternative to school or I may go help a family build a home? Don't screw with my spring break. We can't create these things fast enough to meet the demand of people your age, down here at least. A gap year? There's no such term as a gap year. When I, I was a paralegal because I thought it would be helpful to get into law school. I wasn't doing it to make a difference. Literally, we started a nonprofit called Impact Alabama eight years ago. We have over 360 applications last year from college seniors around the country to come work for a year for $1,000 a month. The average GPA of this staff of 30 we have this year is a 375. Teach for America, as you know, recruits tens of thousands. I think last year, 19% of your damn college applied to Teach for America. 18 and a half from Yale, 45,000 college seniors said, Send me to one of the most malfunctioning schools in America for two years. I want to try to make a difference. Now here's the challenge for you all personally. This is the risk that people increasingly are becoming concerned about with your generation. There's a risk to celebrating your charitable nature. And I'll, you know who I think has put it best? The founder of Habitat for Humanity. I'm sorry, Habitat for Humanity. You. you all heard of that organization, right? <laughs> Beautifully done, beautifully designed nonprofit, right? I mean, there's not enough wall space in this room to fit the awards that organization is. Deservedly won. Increased, he passed away a couple of years ago, but several years before that, he started a housing policy center. You all may know where I'm going with this. That wasn't random. That wasn't just like the next logical step. That was brought on by an increasing sense of anxiety he felt based on what he saw happening. And whatever this was, two decades, however many years ago it was when he started, he would tell you, as he told thousands of people, for him it was a matter of faith. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but for him, he would say, I felt the lack of safe, affordable housing for low income, in particular working Americans, was not only unethical, but immoral. And I designed this nonprofit to do something about it. So you fast forward 15 years. Hundreds of thousands of college students like you have helped out with Habitat Bills. Hundreds of thousands of church congregations have contributed money and time and spring breaks and weekends. And increasingly, he saw this happening. This beautiful phenomenon. But then he started to have anxiety over it happening. He increasingly became fearful, worried, that what he was creating was a story of millions of Americans learning about and agreeing with him that your passion and compassion in this area is earned and your time and attention is deserved and therefore what is asked of you 
you sign up on Saturday, and what time do you get home? I don't know, 6, 7, 6 p.m.? And you've met your obligation to housing for low-income families. Of course you have. You've helped on the habit. You gave up part of your weekend. And he would say, all these years later, all those millions of man hours, all those thousands of churches that have been involved in this issue, take a snapshot of the the market for affordable, safe housing for low-income Americans any day of the week in the last few years. It's as raw and, and not full as it was before. The problem is worse by most indicators. It's not a problem that can only be solved charitably. Every family you help when you do Habitat is worth your time. Charity is a beautiful use of your time. Volunteerism is great. But there's more required. There's more needed. Fortunately, some, hopefully some of you all, especially the pre-med ones in the room, will help at some free clinic. There's all these beautiful community clinics that help provide. You can't charitably deal with 45 million people without health insurance. It's not something you can put on the churches. It's a policy issue. Or as Dr. King would say, it's a justice issue. It's a different part of your mind. It's a different part of your spirit. A sense of charity, helping someone in front of you, beautiful. But there's also a need for you to consider your obligation to consider the way structures of organized power, meaning society, impact other people. Meaning laws and rules, tax policy, educational policy, healthcare delivery mechanism, insurance systems. And for none of us, it can seem too large and daunting to not be involved in. That's the betrayal. Don't ever think that. And factually, you're wrong anyway. None of this is too complicated for anyone in the room. And I don't mean, I mean an issue that you're not in, not in your area. I would argue to you, it's unethical for any of you to say, well, I'm not really learning that much about charter school legislation because I'm not going into medicine, I'm not really an educator. God! <laughs> you're exactly who we need on every one of these issues. There, there's been no prophetic move forward of progress in any policy issue for the last 200 years led by paid think tank people in Washington. It always comes from the spirit and energy and compassion of normal people who are involved in the issue because they care about it, not because they're being paid for it. And in particular, when you talk about a college-educated American, and even more than that, a highly educated college-educated American, mean you all, I, mean, I don't know how, if this seems fair to you or not, there's an extra burden on you all. There's an extra obligation on your shoulders. Whether you want it or not, it's there. Because literally, I'm positive of the impact you all can have to the extent you involve yourselves. And don't let it only be charitable. Now let me say quickly as I finish, this nonprofit came from the idea sort of learning about higher education's role in civic engagement. Have you heard of the term service learning? There was no such term when I was in college. The inclusion of community service and community research and projects in the curriculum across disciplines, so not just for social work students. The whole thing has been revolutionized in the last 15 years across the country. Universities are sort of in this competitive race to provide cooler and bigger platforms for students to make a difference as part of being in college which I think is great for the country. It occurred to me nine years ago, this could be a great business model for a nonprofit in a state like Alabama. To partner with any university they wanted to, to find professors to partner with us, and have projects that could be partly done by students who were doing them as part of a course. And then I wanted there to be a health-related initiative. What can college students do in terms of health care? They could be trained at an adequate level. Just sort of like a movie script, I just kind of fell into this lack of care and vision care. And it turns out no state in the country, even the wealthiest state some of you are from, provide comprehensive vision care to children before public school. The reason being you can't find them in very big numbers, so it makes it a lot more expensive. But it's not worth forgetting about because most children who have a vision problem have it by age two. So you literally have a generation of lower and some middle income families who don't see, whose children don't see pediatricians regularly and some do who still don't have their vision checked. About 10% of kids year after year have a vision problem. So you have a generation of four or five year olds sitting around trying to learn their letters 
and a bunch of them can't tell the difference between a B and a D. And they don't know they can't see well. A child never knows. The child can be going blind in one or both eyes from cataracts and have no idea. They would never know. They would never know a child is seeing differently than them. They would know what blindness is. It's just increasingly a struggle to see. And you literally fall behind in reading and very rarely do they ever catch up. Just one small aspect of a failed healthcare delivery system for children. And there's these cameras that are about 15 years old, the technology, they're about $4,000. They take pictures of children's eyes. You can bring them to the children. So we started Focus First. First year we screened 4,600 children. Partnered with about seven universities, trained students, I have two employees. This last year we have 30 employees. Last year we screened 32,000 two, three, four year olds. In all 67 counties of this state you're in right now, which is one of the most rural poor states in America, we got to over 1,100 daycare centers. All of the children who failed received free follow-up care. There's no vision system in America like Alabama. And the whole thing is executed by people under the age of 23. It's a cool story. We found 10 children last year with cataracts in one eye. Permanently blind within two years. And we've got 20 year olds at the University of Alabama setting their alarm for 5.30 in the morning to come into the Center for Ethics to pick up this $4,000 camera to drive it into a Selma near Dallas County down a dirt road that you can't find on MapQuest to set that thing up in the living room of a trailer that serves as a daycare center to take pictures of eight kids' eyes because they believe in their gut those kids deserve medical care too. And that seems to be the best way to deliver it in this case. I love this experience for college students. Most college students have never heard of a Head Start. They've never thought about health care for three-year-olds with one working parent. And we just deliver great results. And the same staff stopped screening in December, January, and February, and they operate 16 low-income tax sites for low-income families who not only get charged exorbitant amounts by commercial tax preparers, this is something important for you all to know. This is the last important thing I'm going to tell you. Not only is it just hard to be low-income in a lot of different ways, access to services and health care and things like, you know, job training, you also have to be concerned with an entire industry of businesses led by college-educated Americans whose entire business model is created to prey on poor people. It's not just a consequence. It's not just like pollution getting into a poor person's water because they happen to live by some big plant, which is terrible in and of itself. This is business models created to prey on poor people. Payday lending, check cashing, pawn shops, title pawns, the commercial tax preparation industry, that knows low-income Americans with children receive an earned income tax credit, which is the largest federal anti-poverty program. They know the IRS is intimidating to low-income families. It's intimidating all families. And they know 75% of low-income Americans don't feel safe and secure doing it on their own, so they need help. So they open their doors, and they charge on average $300, $350 for about 45 minutes of tax preparation. That often doesn't include any itemization. Everyone in this room would be great at it after seven hours of training. Our staff goes through over 100 hours of training, and we operate these sites. And in about eight weeks, we help 4,400 low-income working families, mostly single mothers, about 40% of whom walk in with multiple W-2s. Most of them don't even know where a welfare office is. They're just trying to raise their children and get by. And in those eight weeks, we secure over $8 million of refunds to those families, helping them save over a million and a half dollars of out-of-pocket costs. Pretty cool eight weeks for a group of 22-year-olds. I think a good experience for the 500 college students we train. Most of them have never sat at a table with someone making $18,000 a year. And I think that's sort of step one to growing compassion and an awareness of an entire sort of substrata of industry that's out there that most college-educated people don't even know exist. That's issue 32 in terms of justice issues alive and well around us. It requires you all being willing to connect with stories and cultures and communities unlike those you're familiar with, and then being concerned for the policy beyond the volunteerism. And with the talent and the intellectual gifts you all have, the, the path will unfold if you engage yourself. That's all I've got to say.
Well. David, share with them some specific ways that they could participate. Because we did have a couple of students last year who at least explored the option to come back the next summer. Because in addition to a year program, don't you have in the summer some short-term programs that someone could spend a little time down yeah, here? Yeah, the summer initiative is an advanced placement mentoring initiative. The state of Alabama received a $13.5 million grant from something called the National Math Science Initiative a few years ago. That's growing the number of high schools we have with AP courses, which the, the majority of high schools in Alabama don't offer any AP courses. And, you know, I think to some people it seems like sort of a simple fix. It's just, it's one important aspect of raising the bar of expectations at, 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 at sort of lower opportunity schools. And in fact, what the city of Houston did so well at showing initially was, no matter how malfunctioning a school is, and no matter how far down the mean may be, and how many kids you have literally who are reading three grade levels below, introducing the culture of the highest expectations available in the nation, which for high school is, if you just want to put it into one word, college level courses at the high school level, you will immediately have kids take you up on it. And it just happens. It's happened in Birmingham, it's happened in Montgomery, it's happened in schools in Huntsville. And the teachers that we met with after the first year of this, and asking if there's a possibility for us to help, what would be the best way, from their sense is, help us with an intensive summer initiative that can just get the kids ready to start. I mean, calculus, I'm not even opening the AP calculus book till the first week of October, because I'm just spending so much time going back through pre-calculus to even sort of get them to so that's what we did. And the superintendent, some of the teachers were worried that it sounded good, but high school kids weren't going to show up. They don't have to be there. They're not getting grades. We started at 8 o'clock in the morning during June doing a difficult subject. And I started worrying. Because you don't know for sure. I just had a sense. And we recruited from different high schools. And then the rooms filled up. Which is sort of funny. When I was in high school, I damn sure wouldn't have woken up at 8 in the morning to come do chemistry or biology, or calculus. Maybe you all did. And we had hundreds of them. And we trained Kauffman. Let me take that back. We don't train. This is one of those initiatives that's, this is the most limited pool of participants we have. Because you can train someone to be good in calculus in a few weeks. To, this starts with college students who are proficient in calculus, biology, or chemistry. And we have this initiative four hours a morning for three weeks in June, with very small number ratios. It's a cool initiative. We'd love to have any of you come back, but that's that's during June. If any of you want to be down here for that. And any of you thinking about taking a year off before medical school, like you, <laughs> you can consider coming down and thank you so much. Sure. And would would you be able to join us for lunch? I can. I know you just we're, we're in the middle of these fundraisers. Actually you all would love these fundraisers. The, it sounds cheesy, but they've been really valuable. They're trivia fundraisers, team trivia, mm -hmm. Birmingham's brightest company charitable trivia event. We had 69 yeah. teams last week. And guess who? I'm part of the team. I didn't. I wasn't on it, but Birmingham Public Library. I work for them. <laughs> they, hey, Birmingham won. Public Library staff won the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna win the state. Not a simple. Hey. I was so cool. proud of my fellow work. Because we raise money, all the companies send teams of six, and they contribute a thousand dollars to Impact, and that's how we raise money. But then they each play for their own favorite charity, and then the winning team's charity at the end of the night gets ten thousand bucks. And we do it at Mobile. We did it on Mobile on Thursday night. We have it on Montgomery next Tuesday, and then Huntsville next Thursday. Then the winning teams of those four cities will have a state championship in April. Where? What time is that going to be? Well, because there's only four teams, we're going to coordinate between the four. And, and what, where is it going to be? You in know? each of the teams' sites. Okay. So it'll be in Birmingham. It'll be in all four cities. We'll sort of do it simulcast. Okay. By computer. By, uh, so, but will there be an audience? I mean, can we yeah. all root for our team? That's okay. yeah. We thought it would be better to have. It's going to be up to you where it's housed. Okay. I mean, I assume it's going to be in the downtown library. Okay. We, we don't know. We're all talking about it. See, we're, we don't know what it is. So I mean, that's Okay, I well, that's good to know. That's I'll where go. you all will want it. Okay. And in, yes. in Mobile, this, this great family run, run, very successful engineering company won. 
which I was so excited about because they're our biggest sponsor down there. And they funded two of their own teams and they funded other nonprofits to play. And then one of their teams won, which was great. Well, we thank you, Tate. And last year it was the same Saturday, and I remember you talking about the same thing <laughs> next year. And assuming we get a, an 11th group to come next year, you can mark off. Um, the 21st of March, we'll be back. <laughs> so we hope you can join us again. And uh, I want to introduce uh, Zandy Moyo, the president of the Harvard Club of Birmingham, who's joined us while we were, we've been uh, here. And everybody will introduce the students to you at lunch, Zandy. Okay, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Stephen. Sure. And I'm Zandi, I'm from the class of 2000, and I was in Mather House. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to say that one of the things that we are working on um, that I hope we get done in the next couple of years is uh, the community service fellowships through the Harvard Alumni Association. And our club is working on raising funding for that. And um, I know we've, we've sort of sort of talked about it, but hopefully we would be able to fund a summer or maybe January term of a student who could maybe be involved so that's something we would that love that. We uh, we think you Harvard kids are pretty good. <laughs> They'll do good work. But can we take a group picture? That'd be great. Uh, with you yeah. before you leave, and then we can head over. To I want you all to figure out a way to invite me up to speak at Harvard. <laughs> I've been speaking at a lot of campuses around the country, but not Penn and Cornell, and yeah, Virginia, we, but not Harvard. Do you do what? education staff? Any any education reform policy? Yeah. Because there's a speech for any kind of form that I know like actively seeks out speakers. Yeah, right. We'll take it. Okay.